You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. And I'm super excited for this episode. The quote for today comes from Aristotle and says, to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing and be nothing. To avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing and be nothing. You'll see a bit later why that quote is so important. Our guest today is Byron Dempsey, who is doing some incredible work to empower young people and shake up the educational system. Through his Driven Young brand and the Driven Young podcast, Byron's amassed more than 600,000 followers and achieved 300,000 podcast downloads. After learning more in two months as an entrepreneur than he did through all of high school, Byron initiated a movement where he teaches practical life skills that aren't taught in schools, so young people are equipped with all they need to succeed in a rapidly changing world. And if you're on TikTok, you might have already seen Byron's empowering work. Through two brands, he's garnered 15 million likes and 600,000 followers and is leading the charge for younger generations to take ownership of their lives. In this episode, we go deep on several topics, including the problem with high school, how young people can succeed, the one decision that catapulted his career, how to go viral on TikTok, and why mental health is about the best metric of health and success. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one who needs to hear this episode, share it with them right now. And if you want to get access to awesome episodes like this one as soon as they're released, hit that subscribe button. All right, let's win the day with Byron Dempsey. Well, Byron, not since wine and cheese first met, has there been a greater pairing than Driven Young and the Win the Day brand? It's so great to see you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Well, you're making massive moves around the world at the moment with the Driven Young brand. What does Driven Young mean to you and what's the change that you're hoping to inspire? So Driven Young, uh, the tagline I use is practical life skills we didn't learn in school. Um, so it's really aiming for Gen Z audience. So it's kind of 15 to 22, 23. Um, and it's really just trying to provide, I guess, what I think school should be teaching us. A lot of soft skills like communication, money and finance, um, emotional intelligence, relationships, um, a bunch of different topics that I think we should be learning. And sh- all these topics are universal and can prepare us for, I guess, almost any job. Like communication skills are going to benefit you in any career you go down, where is learning advanced mathematical stuff is only going to be- benefit you if you're going into a career path that you know requires that skill set. So yeah, that's kind of what it means to me, and it's yeah, it's something I'm very passionate about. Love it. Well, can you take us into the moment that you realised that the traditional education system was broken and that something had to be done about it? Yeah. So I I always had I guess inklings when I was in school. Sorry, let me just let my dog out so he's out of the way for no worries. Leo, get out of here. Come on, let you go. So, yeah, I always had inklings when I was in high school. Um, examples like in biology, I had the most phenomenal teacher and I'd say, Miss, when do we need, you know, why do we need to know this? And she would say stuff like, well, you, you don't actually need to know this in the real world, but you need to know it for exam. And I'd be like, well, what's the point? Isn't school supposed to be pre- preparing us? Um, also stuff like I did two major works. So, in Australia, we have um, major works, which is like um, instead of putting all the weight on a, a final year exam, which all the other subjects do, there's a bunch of subjects that give 50% towards a major project that you spend a year working on, which I love because I just found it was more realistic to what the world would be like working on a project. Um, and I got top of New South Wales for both both of my two major works, which was very validating va- validating to me. But then I completely bombed my exams because I'm just not, not good at that way of thinking. Um, so in high school, I quickly realized, you know, I don't need an ATAR. I want to be a filmmaker. I knew I didn't need don't need marks to be a filmmaker. So I just put a lot of time into making movies and making films for clients and for the school. Um, a lot of the end of year projects I filmed and edited. It wasn't until I got a job with a guy called Glenn Carlson who runs a business called Dent Global. Um, A lot of your listeners may have read his book or heard of his his book or his business partner's book called Key Person of Influence. It's a a bestseller around the world for a really great business book. Highly recommend it. And so, when I I spent about a year with him almost doing like a Gary Vee 
Drake style, following him around, shooting video content for his personal brand. And man, the amount of stuff I learned in that year was phenomenal. I learned about, you know, advanced marketing, Facebook ads, getting into all marketing. I learned communication skills, presenting, um, creativity. I was, I was, because I got to go to all of his business events and network and meet all these cool people. It really opened up my, my mind to the world of business and to, I guess, the adult world. And I just quickly went, man, this is the sort of stuff I should be learning. I've learned more in a month than I have in 12 months at school. Um, and so that, that seed got planted and I started having conversations with people like my dad in the car. Anyone I meet, I start having these conversations and I quickly realized that this wasn't just my opinion and a lot of people agreed with me. And that was, you know, kind of the catalyst for starting starting the podcast. The podcast, funny enough, came through We Are Podcast. Um, I'm not sure if you're involved at that point, but in 2018 um, with Ronzi Vaz, who runs We Are Podcast, I attended the event and I was one of the speakers. So, I got to go to the speakers retreat with like guys like Jordan Harbinger and Pat Flynn. And I, I had no, no idea who these guys were. So, I met these guys, played games with them. And I just realized how powerful podcasting was. And I realized I could marry up all my skills, video, video marketing. Um, I could bring on experts to cover topics that I'm not an expert on and um, podcasting sounded like a great way to build up my communication skills and grow my network as well. So, that's kind of, I guess, the story in a nutshell. Yeah, it's an enormously valuable skill, isn't it? Having podcasting and barriers to entry for any of those things for, for basically no money. Anyone can get started doing all of those different things and get exposed to those experts. There's something you mentioned before that you don't test well. I'm one of those per- uh, one of those people too. I just, just horrible. It doesn't matter how much you study. I just never really yeah. seem to, to test well. And what do you say to people who might might say if all the stuff that you're about is success in the real world, which of course is important, high school is not the real world, but for people who might say that doing well on the exam is what sets them up for success in the real world. Yeah, I mean, th- that's a whole conversation I have. Like, I believe if you flop at high school, like, I guess I didn't flop, but I didn't do that great. I was fine. I was, you know, pretty average. Um, I guess you feel like you're not smart because you didn't fit within the criteria high school sets for you. How- and the flip side is if you're really naturally good, and I have friends who are naturally good at high school, they think they're really smart. And then they get hit like a brick when they enter the real world and go, whoa, these skills don't actually transfer over. Um, so, it's almost like a lose-lose situation no matter what scenario you're in. Um, it's the- to people who are getting great marks, I think that's awesome and that's really valuable. It shows that you can you have a great skill set. However, don't think it's going to, you know, f- you solve all your problems. You're still going to have to work hard. You're still going to have to develop other skills as well. Um, and then people who aren't getting good marks, you know, I, I just think it doesn't matter who you are. Don't rely on your marks. Like, don't let that define you. Whether you get the top possible marks or the bottom possible marks, don't ever let that define you. I mean, how many stories have we heard of successful entrepreneurs who flopped or dropped out or had all these horrible stuff happen and now they're living their dream or whatever? Yeah, there's there's a, a speech that I did once where they had a bunch of people who were who had OP ones, and there was this smugness about most of them, and I just wanted to let them know life is going to abs like no one cares in, mm. in in three months time that you've got an OP one, and there is a level of uh, I, I just really wanted to let them know if I could impart one lesson for them, and I wasn't really there to talk about this, but I just wanted to to grab them and say, look, life is going to absolutely kick you on your ass over and over and over again and how you respond to that irrespective of what's happened in your past is what's going to sep- you, uh, separate you uh, from, from you know the rest of the pack. The OP1 doesn't really have any impact at, or certainly not the level of, of magnitude that we put on it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of my fantasies is to like go into a private school and just like talk to a bunch of guys and something and just like, you know, really give them a bit of a wake up call um, because you're, you're spot on. And I think it's more important now now than ever because the world for ad, for Gen Z and entering the workforce is really difficult and really, I guess, non-linear. Like it used to be kind of simple. You get a degree, you can use that degree to get a job. Um, now you need to be looking at is, it, is the degree I'm getting, is it worthwhile? Is there a demand for that? Um, am I passionate about what, what I'm doing for it? And there's so many variables and questions. Unemployment rate's very high. It's like life is, you know, it, it can be quite tough right now. As much as I, I love this and the amount of opportunities there are, for the everyday person, um, it's really tough. For example, all my high school friends, great guys, love them. Um, I don't think any of them are working in a career that relates to their degree. They're all just working part-time jobs or something. Um, now, obviously, we've got COVID right now in Australia, um, so that's a big factor, but it's kind of just like, 
they're, they're struggling and it's really tough. It's really tough for young people to find a job. So I do think, you know, you've got to really humble yourself when you enter the adult world. It's a completely different beast to the one that we've grown up in. It's, it's almost like in school, they try and put you on a linear path, isn't it? And I was actually, yeah. truth be told, I was always quite envious of those people who said, look, I want to be, you know, a lawyer, then you can go and do the marks. It gets you into the law degree that you want. And that's really great. But for those people who wake up at 35 years of age or 40 years of age and realize that they actually were doing that for their parents, or they were doing it for someone else, or they realized, or possibly, and, and for people who love that career, that's, that's awesome. That's really, really great. Uh, but if you wake up one day and you realize that all of your expertise, all of your skills are in that highly specific area, it can be a bit of a uh, frustrating, really frightening moment to be able to get outside what you already know. But that having that more of a general skill set, which is something that I had, I know that you've had a bit more of a general skill set. We've each had our own specializations in there. So is that a big thing that you'd want to impart for people is having more broader exposure to the ideas of what's possible to insulate yourself from a specialization for a career that you might wake up one day and not realize you're not suited mm. to? Yeah, it's a great question question and before i get to that i wanted to comment on something you said which was exactly that do you waking up at 35 or whatever age going okay now i know this isn't what i want to do i guess my dream of the podcast is to prevent that from happening and help, help you realize that at 18 or 19 it's like to me it's like that is the most valuable thing that you know i can get give to my listeners um but in terms of the specialization and generalization like obviously you know you've got the specialist and the generalist um i think yeah you're right i'm probably more of a generalist but i have special specialities within that um i'm a big fan of young people People just trying as much as I can while they're young. So just be, you know, be a generalist while you're young. I think. Um, try this, try this, try this, try this, and through that, that's where you can find what you're what you're great at and become a specialist. I think I saw Koo and Ray did a video on Instagram, and he's like, um, "How do you figure out what your favorite ice cream cu- flavor is? You try it." right? You taste it. And that's what life is. How do you figure out your passion? I say in quotation marks because it's, you know, a fluffy word, but how do you figure out what you want to do with life and your passion or whatever? Taste it, taste it and try it. And so, I think that is, you know, such valuable information for almost anyone. But the thing is when you're 18 to 25, you can taste things with very little consequences because you're not, you don't have any kids. You don't have anything to look after. Like me compared to you, if, if whatever I'm working on fails right now, I'm in my parents' home right now. I, I, I you know, it's not the end of the world, but for you, you know, I know you've got a young daughter, um, you've got a wife and you've got a lo- lot more responsibilities than me. So, it'd be a lot more higher stakes if you were to go bankrupt or fail than me. And that's what I try and part on young people. It's like recognize this window of freedom you have and use it wisely. That's a really important point. I think people think they have a lot of responsibilities when they're in high school. It's like you feel like, oh, yeah, I've got yeah. no time. Then you're in university, you think like, oh, I've got no time and I've, I've got all this responsibility. Yeah, it's only when you when you get married and you start having having kids and houses and all these other responsibilities that you realize how little time that you actually have and how much time you had back then. And you work with a bunch of motivated go-getters. You've got people in their early 20s, people in their mid-20s who are around you who have big dreams and very little excuses. With the right foundation, is it possible for everyone to be driven young as you define it or is it only for those people who come out of high school with a motivated mindset to begin with? No, absolutely. I think it's anyone. I mean, I've got people who are 35 who listen to my podcast. I've had people who was like, I had a, I had a guy, I forget his name, he, he's 35 and he messaged me. He's just like, hey, mate, I love the podcast. You know, I've just quit my job. You've changed my entire mindset i'm like i mean you're not my target audience but that's amazing like that that's awesome so i do think um you know anyone can listen to my podcast i do just try to keep it relevant to young people um so i think anyone can do it and that, that's the thing it really is anyone and commenting on because whenever i say this i always get comments um of people like well that's easy for you to say you've got you know a level of privilege which is totally true like being born in australia um you know i've, I've always had food and water and all that sort of stuff but a comment one of my previous guests made was everyone can make do with the privilege they're in as in i can look at people who are way more privileged than me and point at them and, and there's gonna be millions of people can point at me up here and it's just like an infinite loop it's like everyone makes do within the privilege they're in so i think you know stop making excuses you know you can find a way um and leverage being young to you know start trying and taking those risks and i, I do think everyone can be you know driven young <laughs> um hence the name of the show Yeah, it's such a great title too. And you mentioned or sort of alluded to individual accountability there, which is an exceptionally important idea. And the more we take responsibility and accountability for our circumstances, the more we empower ourselves to be able to change that and create the circumstances we want, just as if we're busy blaming everyone and everything else for why we haven't got what it is, then we completely remove any ability that we have to be able to change that. When it comes to high school, there's really 
two things here. There's the wider curriculum that we have absolutely or well, pretty much no control over at the time. And then there's individual, individual accountability, which is definitely in our control. If you had your time again at high school, and I know you've, you're already years and years, you're certainly years and years ahead of, of me when I was, when I was your age. Uh, if you had your time again at high school, what would you do differently from an individual accountability perspective? <laughs> Oh, man, I think I'm really glad with how I did high school because I guess I had the um, the realization that I didn't need marks. And so I'm really glad I didn't put my work into marks because and I was lucky because I wanted to go into filmmaking and filmmaking is something that really doesn't require marks. So I was lucky I was going into creative creative field. Um, and so I would just double down on that. Like that was more valuable for me than any any exams or marks, like building up my experience. Um, I would try to grow my network more. Um, maybe I'd be a bit more entrepreneurial. I think it's crazy because I, I know I, I mentioned to you, I run a program called Empower You. Um, I'm, a head, I'm a head presenter there. I've been getting trained up for the past 12 months. So I'm actually going to start running it soon. Um, and it's a life skills program, a personal development program for teenagers. Um, I wish I did that when I was younger. Like, I don't know how I didn't know about it. But I think, if, you know, researching and finding more stuff like that because you can meet incredible people, get access to all this stuff. Um, if I had my time again, I would say go to Empower You and become an assist volunteer and, you know, start building up your leadership skills and that. There's a lot of stuff you can do outside of school that is really going to skyrocket you um, once you get into the adult world. And I think just relying on you know, tertiary education and not doing any extracurricular activities or doing anything outside of it can be quite dangerous because you're almost putting all your eggs in one basket. And then when you graduate and you go, oh, I don't have anything to fluff up my resume, um, which is important nowadays, um, you know, it, it can hit you really hard. Yeah, life's definitely a marathon, not a sprint. And it looks like from all the things that you've, shared, that you've shared today, and obviously you and I have known each other for a long, long time, uh, it sounds like exposure and relationships, like exposure to, to getting out of your comfort zone and to a whole bunch of different things and relationships with people who have had real world success that you can learn from and be mentored by. Uh, it sounds like they're very, very important things. And when I look back at what I learned in high school, I don't remember a single thing that I apply today based mm. on what I learned in high school. I don't think I remember anything at all from what I actually learned in, in high school. I know, and I know I'm a bit removed, from, a bit more re further removed from high school than, than you are. Uh, but one thing I do have is a lot of friendships with people from high school that are still very strong today, which is great. Um, Toastmasters was one thing I was introduced mm. as an optional thing to do for Toastmasters as a public speaking program for people who don't know about that. That was really, really great just to learn a few basics of, of public speaking to develop that confidence at the time. But one thing specifically was the relationships I had with the teachers. Now, it wasn't what they actually taught me. I don't remember anything that they taught Yes. Me but I'm still friends with those teachers, many of them today, which is pretty crazy being, what, 21, 22 years ago it was when I actually graduated from high school. So I, I really uh, value those friendships that I had with the teachers then. So how do you feel about the role of teachers in the Driven Young Awakening? And are they part of the problem or are they part of the solution? Yeah, it's a great question. And I love the point you made because I think, you know, it's funny when you enter high school, in my experience at least, you know, in Australia, we've got, you know, I guess junior high school, which is the first four years, year seven, eight, nine, ten, and then you've got senior high school, which is year eleven and year twelve. And the change when you enter year eleven and year twelve is suddenly your teachers almost treat you like equals, and they become good friends. And it's a really cool experience. I really loved it. Um, and so I, I agree. Like having those friendships is great. And in terms of a teacher's part of the problem or the solution, they're absolutely part of the solution. Um, I said this before. Like I think, especially in I mean, I guess if we're looking at Australia, maybe England and America, but I'll speak on behalf of Australia, teachers really aren't looked up to in society. Like, it's not like an, you see someone who's an engineer and you go, oh, wow, they're studying engineering. Oh, your daughter's studying to be a doctor. Wow. Oh, your daughter's being a teacher. Oh, cool. That's cool. Like, it's not like a, it's, it's not like a really thought after um, degree. And it's also a very low ATAR degree. A lot of people pick it as, you know, a backup plan or, you know, they'll, they're not as passionate about it. And as a result, we get a lot of te teachers who don't aren't doing it for the right reasons. And you can tell. You can tell the teachers who are incredible and the ones who aren't, right? We all know those teachers who are like amazing and the ones who weren't. Um, the other thing is I have a lot of teachers reach out to me saying, hey, I, you know, I listen to the podcast. I love what you're doing. Um, I totally agree with you. You know, we're stuck in a system just like you. Like it's really got nothing to do with the teachers and everything to do with the education system. Because if a teacher goes, you know what, screw this. I want to teach you guys stuff that actually matters. And they teach a class full of kids stuff that really matters. 
they then bomb their exams and the teacher gets fired because of completely f- failed in the eyes of you know the government of the system and so they're trapped just like i mentioned before my t- they're self-aware they, they know a lot of what they're teaching us we're never going to use um and you know I'm, I'm starting to reach out to teachers like i spoke at a school because um, she listened to the podcast and they're implementing life skills a life skills program and they're really trying to change it up as much as they can but they're still stuck in the system so i hope teachers are going to be part of the responsibility i believe we should be putting them on a higher pedestal and making the requirements to be a teacher much higher um, than they are right now because that way we're going to attract higher quality people and high quality teachers um, and in my opinion is one of the most important roles roles in society because it's educating the next generation yeah couldn't agree more and it looks like at the moment that the metrics of success for students are to get good grades so you can do well on not in your exams and the metrics of uh, the metrics of success for teachers are for the students to get good grades then they're revered as as good teachers and clearly through the things that we've mentioned today and all the awesome work that you're doing with the driven young brand uh, we know that that is not the only thing there are other aspects of mental health and making sure that Mm. uh, any individual is able to learn in a way they want to learn about things that they that they want to learn if you could design the perfect high school or even the perfect university i'll, I'll let you pick which one you want what are uh, what things would it include yeah we've kind of we've kind of done this and obviously there's so many moving parts like you can't just fix it like that um my mate joe who's i think i've mentioned him to you he's doing the gap year project with me um and he's a great friend of mine we've got a book coming out soon he organized that entire project and so he created something called Gillage and that's his perfect school and um, look you, you got to take this with a grain of salt because there's so many moving parts but we were like especially during primary school it's like is primary school not just to have a good time like yes we can teach them basic you know times multiplications and all that you know fun, how to read obviously that's important right but I think what's more important is just having a good time in the same with high school like hypothetically we would have a school where like you just go into school and there's classes on and you can just go choose which class you want to go to. If, if you want to sit all day in the sun and read a book, you can do that. If you want to play sport all day and have fun, you can do that. If you want to go learn about science, you can do that. If you want to go learn about this one, you can do that. Um, and there aren't as, as many exams. Um, for example, um, Finland and those countries, I think Finland's number one education system in the world. They, have, they don't have a single exam until you're 18 years old. Um, they also call their teachers by their first name and their teachers get um, paid less, but they work like way less than teachers in Australia. It's like eight, 850 hours a year for teachers in Australia and 600 hours for teachers in Finland. So they get, it's crazy. They're doing less work, but they're getting highly revered um, and they're getting better results. So I think definitely remove a lot of exams. Um, try, try to take the pressure off kids and focus on giving them a good time and really put a focus on the mental health um, over marks. Like it blows my mind how much school prioritizes marks over their kids well-being and you know obviously if there's a way to measure their kids well-being maybe it'd be easier to go look look how bad you guys are doing but there isn't really a way to measure and they don't track it they don't track how many kids have depression or are playing with this stuff so yeah i mean that's a whole conversation we could have and i think if you go to joe's blog and search gillage he's written a whole article about his his perfect school but that's kind of i align with what he's written um and really just Put a focus on experience and making sure they have a good time because what are your memories in school probably when you had great times probably when you broke the rules and you snuck out probably when you had you know valentine's plenty, day plenty of those memories yes yeah yeah like valentine's day when all the year 12s dress up and you know dresses and have fun and you, you know that's the memories you have in year 12 and in, in your school not you know getting good marks or whatever and i think we want to focus more on that yeah, Elon, Elon Musk has something where he actually puts people of different ages together so the older ones act as leaders and they mm. work on ability to solve problems together. Yes. That's just such a great thing to do. And I know you've mentioned this a bunch on your Driven Young podcast, getting people excited about coming to school is almost uh, the first step. So in, in creating an entire curriculum, it, it does seem unusual that we send young kids, like my daughter's two years old, we're going to reach a point with her in a few years, but we have to send her to school for eight hours where she's got to sit mm. there at an uncomfortable desk learning stuff that she that she doesn't want to learn. And it's mm. you do that because that's just part of a system that they need to be able to succeed. And if I had to really boil it down to sort of two attributes of what success would look like for anyone, regardless of age, it would be resourcefulness and resilience. I just think out, mm. of, out of all the work that I have done, it seems to boil down to those two things. How can we get those two attributes, resourcefulness and resilience, into the arsenal of <clears> young people as soon as possible so they feel equipped and inspired to rise above any adversity they face along the way? Yeah. I mean, 
And the key word I think for resilience is like, this is something young people lack. Man, we lack resilience. And it's not our fault. Like, I'm not trying to blame anyone. It's, you know, everything comes so easy to us. Life, you know, comes so easy. If you want to talk to someone, just text them. If you want to get food, just order it online. You don't have to speak with anyone. Like, we have no resilience. Um, And I look at, like, my grandpa who had to, you know, he was one of 11 kids. They had no running water. They lived on, like, a farm in New Zealand. It was cold. They had to walk, you know, know, classic... They always, you know, there's always that story. They had to walk, you know, 10 kilometers to get to school. There's actually a track called Dempsey's Track named after us because they walked it for like 20 years between his kids. Oh, wow. Um, that, that is legitimate then. I was going to say maybe with the older generation, maybe they add two or three miles every every single Yeah, I know. To the story. But if it's Dempsey's Track, I mean... It's, yeah. It's no, I've, I've, I've walked it. It's a pretty pretty good... Tr- it's not that hard, but, you know, doing it every day, it's pretty crazy. Um, school, but, right? yeah. but my point is that, does it, that developed a level of resilience. Same with my dad. You know, my dad joined the army. He believes... Um, that developed a lot of resilience for him. He worked on a farm. All this stuff develops resilience and young people aren't really doing that. So, I think we need to be focusing on that exactly as you say. How do we do that? I mean, I think we put them in positions um, similar to what you said. My mate, Jack, who um, is doing Empower You Presenting with me, he did a program in his school where like a bunch of them would get grouped up and it was like a leadership program and they would say, all right, there's six of you. You've got three minutes to do this task. Go. And they'd have to figure it out. They've got three minutes and they'd analyze everyone and they'd, they'd have different roles and they'd figure it all out. And they did that in lots of different tasks. They'd have three hours to do whatever random task and that, does that, that develops a level of leadership and resilience and heavy resourcefulness like you guys have to think fast you're under pressure um yeah we kind of joke me and my mate luke we joke we're like our education would just be dropping someone off in like a third world country with 50 bucks and say you've got 30 days to find your way home and that's kind of the mindset like i want you know to push on young people like just you've got to put yourself in tough situations and figure out figure the way out i think we have way too many exits as young people which then crushes our resourcefulness and resilience because we can just exit uh, it's the whole going back to the comfort zones, right? Um, we say when your comfort zone, when you step out of your comfort zone, you've got two choices. You can either push through it or you can step back into it. And most people in life step back into it. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned complete discomfort there, but also a very specific goal of getting out of that environment to be able to make it back home. Like it's it's teaching people about goal setting, it's teaching people mm. about resourcefulness and, and being able to establish relationships to to get there, which is, which is great. Uh, what decision has made the biggest impact on your life to date? Um, it's it's funny because I don't know if you've heard me talk about the thousand doors concept, but it's like behind one door is potentially a thousand more. But most, if you, if you see one person, you see one door. That's an opportunity. But you don't know there could be a thousand doors, a thousand opportunities behind that one person. Um, for example, when Ronzi said, "Hey, did, can you jump on a call with James to talk about we are podcast?" and I said, "Yes," you know how long? How many doors were there behind that for me? Just by saying yes to that, um, there was one decision I made. Um, when my when I was like I don't know 14 15 and basically my mum made us go to this camp we had to look after disabled kids for five days so it was a you know five days of our holiday we were like oh we want to do that all right fine we'll do it I said yes to that and the ripple effect for that kind of got me to where I am today just I met this person he introduced me to this that got me into this that got me listening to this person that got me blah 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 and here I am today so I think for me it was just saying yes to everything as a young person like you know that Jim Carrey movie yes man yeah yeah like, I kind of believe in that, like, to, to a degree, not, like, extreme, but, like, just take opportunities. They say a life-changing opportunity comes across your door every two weeks, whether you have the eyes to see it or not. And, yeah, just say yes. Just take opportunities. Put yourself out there. And it's crazy what can happen. Yeah, so true. Even things like reading books, I feel like it's a life-changing mm. philosophy or concept or anything between that, not to mention the relationships. If you're really dialed into that, as you and I have spoken about a bunch privately, leveraging relationships by just doing the right thing and offering as much value as you can and having a specific ask or request of what people in your network can do or who they can connect mm. you with opens up so many different things. And on this on this show, we talk about uh, good habits and what good habits and things people can implement to be successful and to win the day. For you, I want to flip the script on that. What are the bad habits that people need to eliminate if they want to be happy mm. and, and successful and, and fulfilled long term? I think a real simple one is don't go on your phone first thing in the morning. Like, because I've got a pretty structured morning routine now. I also run a company called 530 Club, which is we've got about um, 25 clubs around Australia where people meet at a cafe at 530 every morning. And it's just been incredible. And like for me, I guess during lockdown, I can't do 530 Club at the cafe. I'm still doing it just down in my lounge room. Um, 
but for me, it's like, just don't go on your phone first thing in the morning. That's a terrible habit. Like, and I, I would say when you wake up, don't do that thing where you hit snooze and you kind of lie in bed. Just get up straight away. Like, just do something, get up straight away, you know, start your day. Even if it's reading or going for a walk or something, just start your day. Um, I think that is a real bad habit you want to break. Obviously, the phone is probably especially for young people but for anyone like I think a lot of older generations see young people getting addicted to their phones and, and they think that's not them and they're almost worse I'm seeing you know eight hours a day for you know other older generations so yeah just be cautious of your phone time man you know when you sit down to dinner with someone or, or lunch with someone and every 30 mm. seconds are like let me mm. show you this let me show you that it's like can we please put our phones away yeah like, these things are glued to us constantly yeah yeah and how does it make you feel when someone pulls a phone out um, while you're talking to them and I've, I've done that I've been on that like I've been on the receiving end but I've also done it and I've felt bad I'm like why did I do that because you're not doing it intentionally you're just pulling it out as a reflex that's the it, so admitting that you have an addiction maybe um, is a good first step um, that is probably the immediate habits um, also just getting in the habit of um, you know gratitude you know being grateful for stuff and having perspective which is a big thing right now we're in lockdown I think we're approaching week eight in lockdown which has been really brutal um and, you know, there's been a lot of bad things from it, but just trying to be great, grateful for the, the good things of it. You know, the fact, you know, it's not the end of the world. Life will move on. Um, I like also like journaling, which I know is probably, that's not, a, that's a good habit. But um, so, yeah, I've just switched to good habits, I realize. But yeah, breaking the phone and, um, you know, the wake up, you know, just have a good morning routine. Break your bad morning t- r- r- routine. Yeah, I guess the flip side of every bad habit is, is a good habit on the other. Yeah. Way. So really, really valuable points. Uh, we've mentioned your Driven Young podcast a bunch already. It's incredible. And anyone who's watching this on YouTube or listening to the podcast, stop what you're doing right now. We'll, we'll keep this playing in the background, but go and subscribe to the Driven Young podcast. Byron, how has your life changed from a growth perspective since you made the decision to get into podcasting? Oh, man, how long do you have? <laughs> a lot. I mean, there's just been so many benefits and I could talk about podcasting for a long time. Um, I think one thing I underestimated was the networking you get from podcasting. And because I do all my interviews in person as well, um, it's like a you know two and a half hour thing you know um they that you know they, they drive all the way out to me we'll have a coffee for 30 minutes beforehand we'll build a bit of a rapport have a chat do a one hour podcast then speak for another 30 minutes off camera um and then you know then they'll go home and so i build really really strong relationships with my guests and it's just been such an incredible way to grow my network and you know it's funny all my all my friends actually have somehow come through the podcast. Um, you know, I, I, I had someone on the show, then she introduced me to this person and now I've got a whole friend group from that. Um, and so pretty much every aspect of my life has changed because of the podcast. The whole reason I met Joe, who's my co-founder and a good mate of mine, and I'm, I've got this book coming out, which I'm one of the authors, is because I have a podcast and I got introduced to this person. He didn't, It's not that he, came, he wanted to come on the podcast, but the only reason I had a connection to him was because I had someone on the podcast. And it's just like infinite doors have opened because of it and I, it, I almost can't explain it um, so it's just been incredible and obviously I've built a big following online which has been opened up a lot of doors as well um, and just the the lives you can impact I get messages every week from people who send me like not just hey I love the podcast but like huge paragraphs about how much it's changed their life and it's just phenomenal I've had I, I screenshotted it. I'm not sure if I've shown you it. Of a 14-year-old girl from Canada who sent me the most beautiful message about how her and her parents listened to it together, and it's just like it's crazy how much just saying some things can change people's lives. Um, the other thing, and I don't know if you've had this, James. I the way I listen to podcasts. If I like, if I discover your show, I'll flick through the most recent 10 episodes, maybe pick one or two. I've had people go back and listen to every single episode. They'll go back to the start and go through every episode, which is like 70. Um, I, that's not how I do podcasts, and I didn't realize other people do that. But that was crazy to me. I don't know. Do you have a, Do you notice your listeners do that as well? Absolutely, and I feel awkward saying this. I don't even want to go back and listen to my earlier episodes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you try something new for the first time, it's like, oh, what do we What do we want to do? But my first episode was called 10 Tips to Handle the Haters" because I feel like that's just such an important thing. Is how do we handle that negative energy from from people around it? And what I have thought about is actually redoing that one because uh, I did that. It was literally the very first episode I did in podcasting so like anyone when they start anything new I I didn't really have much of an idea of of what I was doing and my podcast like yours has been able to evolve so much so I'm actually thinking about redoing 10 tips to handle the haters for, for an upcoming episode yeah I mean my most listened to episode is episode number one which I didn't expect I wish I had known that at the time <laughs> but um yeah so 
it's just been it's just been huge. I can't even put into words how much it's changed my life in terms of opportunities and growth. And obviously, it's great because I've learned from seventy people, and then I edit the podcast, and then I listen to it again. So it's like this stuff just becomes who I am. Um, it's also accountability. Like I, if I'm teaching people to do this, I need to be doing it as well. So yeah, so many benefits. Yeah, it's forced learning to consume the content of the person you're having on the show beforehand. It's the relationships. It's getting better at communication. It's great branding oh. and omnipresence on social media. Mm, I didn't even mention the communication skills, like the ability to ask questions. And I know I have a lot of people reach out and say, I just love the way you do your podcast. It's super conversational. Like it's so easy to listen to. And that's, you know, such a cool thing to hear that, like, you know, I'm becoming a good podcaster. I'm not just another guy with a podcast. I'm actually put a lot of time and effort into, you know, mastering this craft. So it's very validating when people mention that. And so, yeah, there's just infinite benefits to starting a podcast, which is what I push on people because the whole message of starting a podcast now is kind of like, oh, you're just another guy or another person starting a podcast, which I totally understand. But, you know, even if you have no listeners, there's infinite benefits to starting one. Absolutely. The ROI of having a podcast, if you do it in the right way, is 10 times the value before anyone even listens to the episode. Yes. If you do it, if you do it the right way. Yeah. And the other thing I would say, if anyone of your listeners are like wanting to start a podcast, but worried about the judgment, I don't want to be just another guy selling a podcast. You have to understand everyone is starting podcasts, but very few people are actually maintaining them. And so while you might think, oh, everyone's starting a podcast, that's true, but not many people are actually consistently doing it. Like every time I come across someone who has a podcast, it's almost, I can guarantee you, it's, it's, I look at, I look at their most recent episode and it'll be like eight months ago or a year ago. And I'm like, yep, classic, because not many people stick through it. So if you just stick to it, you'll be in the top, you know, 20% of podcasters. Yeah, really, really great point. And you've leveraged your podcast. You've really become the, the king of TikTok. You're doing amazing things on there. You're inspiring me with all your TikTok stuff. You've got more than 300,000 followers on TikTok. You've had more than 10 million likes. For those who want to dominate TikTok, it's certainly the it platform at the moment. As a user, I think it's just hilarious to to use. I don't even want to watch a TV show on downtime anymore because I feel mm. like some of the TikTok content is just so on point. It's it's great. Uh, what specific? What spe- Let me start that again. What specific steps should someone take if they want to dominate TikTok today? Yeah, well, I mean, I've got a free training. If everyone wants to go to that, it's just um, I'll put a you can put a link below or something. I forget the exact link, um, but that's like a twenty five minute video. I break down my entire strategy um, of how I've grown on TikTok. Um, it's very much. A very, you've just got to, first of all, you've got to get on the platform and understand it. It's completely different to any other platform like you've seen before. Um, and you've just got to start creating content. You've just got to start putting yourself out there. Um, just keep putting yourself out there and don't worry about the judgment. Um, for me, you know, I'm, I still, I just do podcast clips. I just take clips from my episode and post, post them onto TikTok. And um, I've mimicked that strategy. I've got a second account with 300,000 followers. Um, so we've got 600,000 followers on TikTok. I've grown two podcasts to be quite successful through the platform alone. And it's just been in- incredibly beneficial. So, immediate steps I would say is get on the platform um, make sure you fill up the whole video so don't do like a square you want it to look native on the sh- on the app um, use TikTok fonts and titles so it looks like it belongs in the app and it's not like a um, you know an ad you don't want to look like an ad uh, make sure you have an engaging title an engaging half to one second it's got to be bang straight into the content um, remove any ums and ahs and remove anything that doesn't pres- progress a story sometimes i'll cut out 20 seconds of a snippet because they, they make a really good point but it doesn't progress the overall message so cut it out it's like um and i do that with a lot of stuff in my life peter jackson when he was making lord of the rings um had to condense you know a massive book into one movie each and the, basically him and his wife and his wife was one of the um head writers with him on the project they said does this progress the story of the plot nope it's gone you know, oh, that seems so good. It's so funny. It's so entertaining. It doesn't progress the story of the plot. Cut it out. That, and you've got to do that with your content on TikTok as well. Um, so, yeah, just get on there. I mean, I understand. I don't know how many downloads you get, but let's say 5,000 people listen to this. I would guess one or two would maybe actually get on the platform after hearing this. Um, and that's great advantage because no one's getting on it. Um, it's a bit of a blue ocean for educational content. It's very difficult, but it's, it's, the ROI can be huge because the organic reach on that platform is insane. Yeah, absolutely. And what what video have you posted on TikTok that's got the most surprising response? Um, 
I mean, it's interesting because you know, I should listen to your first episode. I get a lot of hate on TikTok um, <laughs> just through educational content. A lot, not, I mean, whether, whether it's hate or people just always arguing because you put out different opinions and stuff. For me, my most viral series was um, called, it was called a Boys vs. Girls Experiment. And it was a conversation with one of my guests about masculinity and how men struggle to show their emotions. And it got received really well. It's had over 30 million views across that whole series. So, I did about eight, an eight-part series and people watched that, you know, over 30 million views for that which has been incredible and that was my first viral video it really got me on the map and so that was and that it was also very positive it's kind of rare i get a viral video that's just positive if i get a viral video there's often a bit of controversy or there's some sort of differing opinions but this one was universally received and that gave me a lot of confidence um i also have my my other podcast which is on sexual assault um awareness and consent We've had some huge videos on that. I'm um, just talking about, you know, what if two people are drunk and they have sex and one of them feels like blah, blah, blah. And we unpack all these different stories and how you can, you know, get educated in this space. So, yeah, I've also, you know, I've had videos go viral when I talk about the school system or I've had lots and lots of viral videos across a variety of topics. Some of them not very well received, some of them very well received, most of them in between. Um, but yeah, it's just a numbers game. Like my whole strategy is throw enough mud on the wall and one will stick. You look at my account now, most of my videos get like three, 4,000 views. But because I post so often, you know, if I post three videos a day, I only need one of them to do well. I only need one, I only need two of my 30 videos a week to do well. And I hit, you know, a million, a million views a week and so that's really my strategy yeah you can't go viral if you don't publish and it is exactly yeah it is interesting where you think that there's a video that's going to be a, an absolute smash hit whether it's tiktok reels whatever it might be and you post it and it does nothing and then you can yeah. post another one that you're almost reluctant to post and it just crushes it like at the end of the day that it's validated once you put it out there you can't really validate it before it's it's put out there james i cannot express how many times this happened to me like even recently i had this great episode um with a guy called tom nash who's missing both arms both legs and he's an incredible guy we did some i was like these clips are gonna crush it these clips they're gonna do so well and we'll look we've had some do really well but so many of them have bombed and i'm like oh man i thought they're gonna do well then there's been other clips where you post him and you're like oh this is all right and it goes mega viral um i i would like to think at this point i have a good estimate and a lot of time i do but still some of them catch me by surprise um some of them go mega viral some of them don't and it's just it's really a numbers game and i think removing your expectations is really important when creating content tiktok can be really difficult to grow on because you get this hit of virality and you get this expectation that your video is going to go viral and you're going to keep having followers but to set an expectation my account hasn't grown like a graph just slowly going more and more it's mega growth and then almost nothing and then mega growth and then almost nothing and when you're in this almost nothing stage you feel like like worthless because you've you've felt what it's like to be getting a thousand followers a day or whatever and that's that's a whole nother conversation unpacking the psychology of that but this is why most people don't survive on tiktok like the amount of accounts who do well then they give up it's really difficult to go on that platform because it's so it just ragdolls you and it's um but if you can push through it it can be very beneficial you mentioned your intentional gap year project earlier i know that's something you've been working you're very passionate about and have been working on a bunch behind the scenes can you tell us about that intentional gap year and what people can do to get involved yeah, look, I'm I'm so excited about this. I think this could be my biggest project. Um, out of everything I'm working on, this will probably be like almost a glue that brings a lot of stuff together. Um, I've had the idea for a while, um, but when I mentioned it to my mate Joe, he was like, "Let's just let's do it." Like, I'll help you out. Let's do it. Um, and let's tie it in with our book launch. So we've got a book launch coming um, on September 1st. And then we're launching it mid-September. And um, we're going to kind of tie in the Gap Year project. But basically, it's kind of like... A year between high school and university, so a gap year, everyone knows what a gap year is, but it's intentional and we're going to provide them with a whole community of young people. We've got our own custom social media platform. We're going to have um, personal development events. We're going to have lots of partying and outdoor activities, like heaps of festivals. We're going to partner with festivals. Um, we're doing like you know outdoors retreats where you can go into the bush for two days with an expert and he'll you know teach you how to survive and really you know become one with the bush and feel, you know, get away from technology. And then we'll be doing huge boat parties on the Sydney Harbour with drinks and everything. And then we'll be doing personal development events and monthly workshops and fortnightly masterminds so people can stay in contact and really gamify it. So it's like a lot of fun and people want to do it. It's really just supposed to be a really fun experience for a year. It's like, give me a year. There is, I, I'm yet to have a single argument for going from high school directly to university. It doesn't matter how prepared you are. There's no harm in taking a year off. When you're 50 and you look back at your life or 
80 or 90, you're not going to look at, oh, I went to university that extra year. You'll look back at that amazing time you had when you're young. Um, so it's really about a year about building good connections and friendships, having fun, traveling, getting work experience, getting internships, growing yourself. And um, as we mentioned, James, and you helped me come up with it, you know, the three kind of pillars are almost, we're going to build great relationships, grow your network, get surround you with amazing people. We're going to give you access to really great mentors and you can get great mentorship. And more importantly, we're going to give you access so you can get real world experience. We're going to set you up with work experience opportunities and internship opportunities so you can begin to taste all these different careers and see which ones suit you. We'll also give you access to hate, um, university students so you can like question them and um, really it's just so many moving parts in it and it's very very exciting and um, yeah if anyone's interested in getting involved we're doing information nights um, just go to driven young forward slash IGY and yeah we're doing information nights there you can book in there and just for free come along to see what it's like um, we're running a beta program in December January February and if that's successful then we'll really launch it um, I guess to the world and the cool part James is you know we're running in Sydney but there's no anyone could do it if you're in the uk or if you're in america and you go i want to take a gap year in australia come to sydney join us like come do the program in sydney like how cool would that be so yeah it's very exciting a bit different to enrolling in a program that you have no interest in and dropping out a year or two later after that like that's the type of thing that you might regret but having a kick-ass time for a year in a place like uh sydney uh with this i think is amazing so drivenyoung.com slash igy is that right that's the url for people to yeah that's correct so it's called right now the name is intentional gap year we might change it but that's the name for now um so yeah drivenyoung.com forward slash igy but yeah it's very exciting and exactly as you say and even then like you know people can do it and do university at the same time if they really want to but it's like just give us a year or give us three months just you know just have fun let you've just done 12 years of schooling take a break you deserve it you know i, I really think that is important and you know, we're really trying to gamify it, like have like tribes, like survival almost, have different tribes and have tribe leaders and just, yeah, create a really cool experience. So I'm excited. Yeah, sounds perfect. Oh, to be young again, I'd love to be involved in the Gap <laughs> project. It's a, it's a no-brainer. And uh, since you embarked, you know, we, we like to keep it pretty real from a mental health perspective on this show. Since you embarked on your entrepreneurial journey, is there a particularly dark day that stands out to you that you'd be open to sharing with us today? Yeah, I actually, um, there was a day, it's, it was a day I started journaling because it was my first journal entry and it was, a, it was one of simultaneously, so much happened in that day. So basically, um, in the morning, I met Brent and Brent Williams, who is now my, my mentor. He runs Empower You, the program I mentioned. He's been training me up for the past 12 months and um, that valuable that has been the most valuable connection to me. Like he's taught me so much. I've learned so much from him. I'm now like a trained presenter. We, you know, we're presenting 24 hours straight essentially, 12 hours one day, then 12 hours another day with a room full of you know 50 kids. It's the most difficult audience to present to. So that was incredible. He, I had him on the podcast, amazing episode. Um, I was so excited. He At the time he said, look, for the first time in 20 years, I'm looking to train up presenters. And I went, that has to be me. I'm going to come into the van. I did everything I could. And I've been doing everything I could to build that relationship. And I have successfully. So that was, I had this great morning. And then I went home early from the office. And as I got home, my sister comes out and she said, Byron, um, grandma's in hospital. She's just had a heart attack. She's not going to make it. And I was like, whoa. So I went from this immediate high to this immediate low. So we hopped in the car and drove to the hospital. Um, this was still during COVID. And so no one was allowed in usually only one person was allowed in but because she was in icu it pretty much gonna die um the whole family was allowed in and it was very emotional you know walking up to her and you know she's very drugged up and um you know sitting down and you say your final words and you know you know this is the last thing you're ever going to say to them and so it was very emotional so i was like on this big low i was just like oh man this is really sad um and then i pulled out my phone to like distract myself and at the time i was working on this project called the hsc roundtable sessions which is connecting a bunch of um, top university students with younger people so they can teach them and this girl like called me out publicly um she was saying byron dempsey is you know trying to rip people off by charging money he's not even paying the vol the volunteers which everyone applied it was a volunteer position and she was like my first time someone had like hated on me publicly and called me out and it was like a you know dagger to the heart and that was like in the midst of how so i was very emotional i had that my grandma was dying i had this huge thing happen um and then you know and then my friends all went and backed up and commented on a post and you know was supporting me which is great um and then 
funny enough, she ended up surviving and she's still alive today and she pulled through, which was like, no one expected it. And so, but that day was just like this emotional, like whiplash. I had this great high and this mega low. Um, and so for me, that's always like a big day for like, you know, almost represents entrepreneurship, like this mega, mega high and then a bang straight into a mega low. And that's been my whole journey. It's like, I have these huge highs and then something falls through and massive low. But then the high always comes back and it's just this big, big, um, big thing. So yeah, that was a, a big turning point for me. Yeah, really important thing. It's it's interesting, isn't it? When you, I remember the first time when I read a negative book review, it's just a numbers game. If you're out there, mm. you're putting yourself out there enough, if you're doing videos, if you're publishing books, whatever it might be, podcasts, you will eventually put yourself in the in the face of, of criticism. And they say to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. Yeah. And, you and, and I, I, yeah, you and I would much rather do something. We would rather be someone, even mm. if it entails and, and encompasses some of those things. And because we know that inspiring all of the people that we can along the way is much more important than someone that that one comment that they make says more about them than it does about you or me. Mm, and I, I remember hearing people like you say that when I was younger and I was like, I'll be different. I'm going to create this podcast. All my intentions are, you know, I'm not making any money from it. I'm purely trying to help young people. Um, I'm not going to get in, in, why would I get any negative comments? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and then I've had so many, like it, I was even saying to my mom, it really t- wears a way at me. Like TikTok's been great for me, but also just getting negative comments like, every single day for a year obviously i get great comments as well but you know you often your brain focuses on the negative ones and yeah so for me i guess you really need to understand that like you're gonna get hate no matter what you do i would always look at people like these these dumbasses like influencers like jake paul or something who's like he knows he's gonna get hate because he's he's doing it intentionally to get hate yeah (laughs) yeah and i was just like well that makes sense but i'm not doing that i've got good intentions i don't you know i won't get hate but you do and i think you just have to accept that like it's and i don't know how to deal with that i'm not a psychologist or an expert i'm i'd love to interview someone who can help you deal with that sort of stuff but i think it's difficult like my brain struggles to comprehend that you know someone could leave a hate comment on a tiktok video and it gets ten thousand likes so like ten thousand people agree with that and i'm like man how can that many people like my brain can't comprehend that number and so yeah, that's definitely something that I've struggled with going into the social media game. And I would say, like, you have to be mentally in a good space if you're going to do, be doing what I'm doing and probably what you're doing. Otherwise, it could crush you and cripple you. Yeah, 10 tips to handle the haters, Byron. I'm telling you, it's a good I episode. I, I, need to, I need to redo that one. I'll go listen to it for sure. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting. I, I, I had something that happened that recently it was actually someone had uh, taken photos that I had put on Instagram of my daughter and I and this person who through a period of two years had amassed almost 10,000 followers on LinkedIn using all of my information, photos of my daughter, all this stuff and had scammed at least one person who contacted me to say that they had given this this person thirty thousand dollars and i couldn't believe it and that I almost no way yeah i almost dropped my phone when i read it and it made me um not want to post about my daughter and my family which is which is my life like what else do you do wow. all this stuff for and then it's like look at the end of the day you can't be entirely influenced by this one person there are unscrupulous people out there who are who are going to be confronted with every single day we just got to focus on, on what's in our control. If there is constructive feedback that we can action, that's great. All the other stuff we can discard, know that we've got the right network and, and people around us. But I have no idea personally, uh, and it sounds like you too, I would really, really struggle being one of those super high level um, people who have like 10 million, 20 million, 50 million followers on social media. Like it must be, you just wouldn't be able to to run those things yourself. yourself. You'd have to. Yeah, well, I mean, because I was talking to my mum about it and like, I always wonder, like, how did, how did Gary Vee and a lot of the bigger guys and I guess the universe that I'm in, how do they deal with it? And I, you know, I think they, they kind of just go just ignore the haters and stuff. And I, I, I have been doing that, but also I guess it means I'm not dealing with my emotions because I'm just sweeping them under a rug almost. I'm just like just blocking them out, which I think can be harmful. Like, and that's why I was like, I should almost, you know, I've been reaching out to a few people like, how do you deal with knowing that you know people constantly say you know i hate this guy i hate this podcast someone you never never met and then he gets five thousand likes which means all these people agree with him or whatever and i just like i'm not too sure i don't know the answer um but it is it is brutal like it's something and i'm always trying to work on and i had a whole scandal almost um i never told you this but like with the sexual assault podcast we posted a clip and it was my most viral video ever 22 million views on one video and it just went off and it was it was just this hypothetical scenario of what if someone lied about their age and then they hooked up with someone who was below the age of consent what's the deal there and you know it 
it just got so much hate because people were like, oh, it's two men making up a hypothetical scenario. And, you know, we had, I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of duets on TikTok, which is when someone stitches your video, duets it, just saying, you know, calling us rapists and pedophiles. And I was just like, I put so much work into this podcast for no money at all. I still haven't made a single dollar from it um, because I wanted to get the stuff out there and it's something that's meaningful to me and have to have hundreds of people that don't realize it, but we're on the same team, call me like these words was so just like... It was just like heartbreaking. I was like, I feel like, what's the point in even doing this? Should I even do a season two if I'm just going to get this much hate? Um, but, you know, I think the reason so many men aren't speaking up about this topic is for that reason. And so I need to keep speaking up about it. So that was, and I did a whole apology, not an apology video. I addressed the video and it got really well received. And a lot of people took down their videos and apologized. So that was really great. But that was just like, for, th- for three months, I just had hundreds and hundreds. And every day people were mentioning me in comments and just like calling us out, even though we were on the same team i just wanted to grab them and be like we're on the same team i'm trying to support what you're saying um and that's where you know the whole downside of social media that's the downside yeah i saw a video actually that gary v had posted yesterday where he was talking about it's easy for someone to have a judgment based on what they see like if someone was listening to this podcast or if they watch a, a video of me or gary vaynerchuk or whatever for 30 seconds or, or one minute and that's their only snapshot of that person based on that snapshot they're not going to have any clue like mm. not any real idea as to as to who we are and if they if they're willing if they're that quick and irrational to come up with an emotional judgment on who someone is and they've got no idea about the impact and everything else that, that other people do behind the scenes and and the positive things that they bring to people in their lives. So it's just it, it just comes with the with the territory. And it leads me to the last question I wanted to ask you before we move into the the win the day rocket round. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard to show yourself on your worst day? Oh man, on your best day. Yeah, and take a moment. Take a think of a, a moment. Of yeah, a yeah. On, this. on on your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard? That you could hold up to show yourself on your worst day i think and the whole reason if you've listened to my podcast every single episode at the beginning i do a whole intro and everything i say as per usual guys please dm me on instagram if you're enjoying it and a big reason i do that is almost selfish reasons like i just that is those dms keep me going that's i, I remind myself that's the reason i do it and so i would almost just be like I almost just put that girl's name like Angela. That's I remember her name. I just put like, remember Angela, the 14 year old who listens to every episode with her parents. It's like, remember why you're doing it. And so on your best, on your best day, I just say, remember those messages you, you've received. So maybe I just write, you know, remember, remember the messages or remember Angela because, you know, I find just focusing and remembering of that brings me so much joy. And I've got a whole folder. I screenshot every message. I've got about, you know, 300 screenshots of like these huge messages of people saying they changed their life. I had one guy send me an audio message saying, hey man, you know, next time in Sydney, I'll buy your coffee. I just landed a twenty thousand dollar university scholarship because of what you said in the podcast, and I'm just like, it's just crazy. So I think just remembering the impact you can have, instead of focusing on the negative stuff I mentioned, kind of the past ten minutes, really focusing on the positive stuff. So I probably just write Remem- remember the messages or remember Angela, and as soon as I think of that, I immediately feel like I'm in a better place. Yeah, John Asaraf shared in an earlier episode of the show. John Asaraf is the uh, was on the film The Secret. That was a mega success that people remember from 2006. He mentioned that rather than doing like a vision board, he likes having an achievement board of all the things that he's been able to do. And it sounds like you mm. have that almost that database of having a impact board of all the lives and things that you've been able to impact. And I think that's oh. interesting. You know, that's something I actually need to do. I should be doing that during lockdown. Um, someone mentioned it to me. I had this idea. I wanted to print out the screenshots and put them up on my wall. And I just, I might do that. I completely forgot. But I think that's something I should do because, yeah, for me, that is that is really a big thing. And I've never had, I think I've had like one or two negative DMs. That's it. No one ever like has the guts to actually message me negatively because they'll, they'll, they'll comment something, but it's always positive And I've got to focus on that rather than the negative. So, yeah, I love that. I think I'll, I think I'll do that. Maybe even today I might create a little collage and print them out. Well, let's now move into the win the day rocket round. 10 questions for some fairly quick answers. You up for this one, Byron? Sounds great. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Um, I don't want to butcher it, but it was how you, how you make your money is more important than how much money you make. Great one. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Oh. You can morning say both. coffee. I'm both. Yeah. yeah, I'm a bit of both, but morning <laughs> coffee. Let's say, especially living in Sydney. I mean, god damn, the the great coffee in in Sydney. It's real. Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18 year old self, which I know wasn't that long ago for you? 
Yeah, I mean, just keep keep doing it. Take as many risks as you can. Go full out. Say yes to everything, and um, just keep taking as many opportunities and take as many risks as possible. Number four, what book do you gift the most? How to Win Friends and Influence People, or and I'll bring it up here. How to Win Friends and Influence People, absolute classic. One of my favorite all time books too. Yeah, that's that's usually my go to because it's just such a generic and like valuable to anyone there's this new book here which is called the shit they never taught you and it's um 120 personal development books condensed into one and it's just it is the biggest back to back like you can read this how to win friends and influence people in here summarized in like four pages obviously not as good as a whole book but this is like so good so probably one of those two yeah it looks great uh number five was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower um I think putting myself out on social media has been my biggest superpower um, and those very much felt very vulnerable like putting yourself to the world and just putting out content like it's it's scary as I'm sure anyone listening would know if you've ever put out content before so I guess putting out content has probably turned into my superpower. Yeah and you've been able to impact millions of people around the world through that which is amazing. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? Embrace it and it, failure is really... Um, you know, an opportunity to learn. The other thing I'd say is if you imagine like a pyramid and at the bottom of the pyramid are like tiny failures, like you forgot your alarm, you forgot to hit snooze or like, you know, you know, I don't know, whatever, tiny little failures, then the next level is slightly bigger, bigger, bigger. If you imagine the top of the pyramid is like the worst things that could ever happen to you, like your parents die or something. I honestly believe anything below the top doesn't really matter. Like anything below long term doesn't really matter. For example, I don't think I've ever had anything happen in the top. My house burnt down when I was 11 years old, which some people might put it in the top. But fact is, that's why we moved to Australia. And that's why I'm where I am today. And, you know, we've recovered pretty well. It impacted us a lot. But yeah, really long term, if it failure doesn't even exist. It's um, except for like the top, the top, top. Um, embrace it. And I think every young person needs to embrace failure. Mm. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Oh, man. That's tough. I'm not too sure. I think... Um, and he's died now. I don't know, just because he aligns so much with what I talk about. So, Ken Robinson, I don't know if you know him, but he, his mission was kind of just all about the education system and young people. He's kind of like the go-to person. So, I think maybe, and he died last year, actually while I was writing the book, which was funny enough. Um, so, maybe him, I think, or someone like, you know, Marcus Aurelius or someone from like, you know, the Roman times, like philosophers back true. then or like yeah. Julius Caesar, someone like that. If I, could, if I could do anyone, you know, go back then and like find out more about their culture and his mindset and the way they live. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or business? Well, I think um, the Google Suite has been like just put everything in the Google Suite. It includes Drive, Gmail, um, everything in there is incredible. That combined with um, Notion and Calendly, those are the three tools. You're set. That's all I need. I think that's the best answer we've had on the show, actually. That's, oh, really? That's great. People normally have boring ones like Slack, but yes, that is a really good practical one. So I love that. Uh, number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Um, I want to go swimming with the whales with my mum. I think definitely. Um, I know she's a big fan of that, so that's definitely one of them. Yeah, love it. And final question: What's one thing you do to win the day? Five thirty club. Join the five thirty club, man. And look, I understand the, the the cringiness behind like the oh wake up early and everything. I totally get that. I don't even read personal development books. I read fiction. Like this is a book I'm reading right now. So it's like fictional stories, but just 530 Club has changed, changed my entire life, not just through productivity, but through the people I meet as well. So start a 530 Club. Go meet people at a cafe at 530 in the morning. That has just been absolutely game changer for me and I love it. Yeah, the people who can motivate themselves to, to get up and do that, they're the people you want to, you want to be around. Exactly. It self-filters out anyone who's, you know, not as motivated or maybe different types of personalities. So, it's, it's great. Yeah. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Byron and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on TikTok at Byron Dempsey. You've probably seen him blowing up there already. Uh, Instagram at Byron underscore Dempsey. You can subscribe to his Driven Young podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts and visit his website, drivenyoung.com. We've also included a bunch of things from the show like um, TikTok trainings, uh, the Intentional Gap Year, all of that stuff and more will be linked in the show notes. Byron, 
always great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a really fun chat. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Byron. He's certainly a long way ahead of where I was at his age, and he has a very bright future. Again, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. If you enjoyed this episode, hit that subscribe button. You can also drop a comment on the YouTube video to let us know your favorite takeaway. And if you wanna do me a favor, give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help more people find it. That's all for this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.